clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Uh, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ, Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Well, as your pastor, I want to speak to you about how you should approach the year ahead. 2022 is past, I can't believe it, can you? Perhaps it was a good year for you. Perhaps it wasn't such a great year and you're glad to see the back of it. But what I can be 100% sure of, because fundamentally at its root we're all the same as human beings, we will all have longings for the year ahead. Perhaps for some of you, 2022 was such a bad year that you're just saying, hopefully, as long as it's just better than the year before, um, I can live with that. Some of you will have very specific aspirations to lose weight, to save for that mortgage, to finish that DIY project, to read the Bible in a year, to read more books, Christian books perhaps, find a new job, watch less TV, exercise more, more hospitality, spend money more wisely, be more generous... Job security, spend more time with your spouse, your children, your grandchildren. And some of you might even have some what we might call exclusively spiritual goals. Victory over a particular besetting sin that you're, you just could not shake off in 2022. Going to spend more time in prayer uh, this year. Perhaps it's the longing for a conversion of a loved one, perhaps a child or a daughter. Perhaps you're determined, this year I'm going to witness to my neighbour, I'm going to invite them to church. Perhaps it's more broadly the growth of the church, maybe a new evangelistic endeavours. Whatever it is, these are all, I don't think I've mentioned a single thing which is a bad aspiration to have. They're all very good things. And, and, and what is true is when you, when you have such aims and such, such goals, you make plans to fulfil those goals. But herein lies the danger. These things are all well and good. But when these things become your goals for the year... What do you do when they're not attainable? Because none of these things are in your control to some extent. We could go through every one of them and we could discuss factors outside of your control that could occur in your life that would make all of those legitimate and good aims impossible to fulfil. And so if you make these aims, and if you have, I'm sure you maybe have other ones I haven't mentioned, but if you make anything along these, those lines, your aim, your goal, you're focusing on 2023, you are probably setting yourself up for constant frustration, frustrate, frustration anxiety and, and, and disappointment. It's in such times as this, at the beginning of the new year, we should remember what James had to say to those he was writing to. James chapter 4, verse 13 to 15 come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city spend a year there buy and sell make and profit whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow for what is your life it is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away instead you ought to say if the lord wills we shall live and do this or that But now you boast in your arrogance. Life in a fallen world rarely goes exactly to plan. And if I'm being brutally honest, many of the aims we might have, good enough themselves, probably won't be successfully realised for one reason or another. Now, Paul Peter is writing to people, believers, who are going through a torrid time. And we might actually say that the life they are experiencing is the normal Christian life. 
He opens the letter and straight away you get an insight into the fact that things aren't too good for these people by what he, how he describes them. He calls them pilgrims, verse 1 of chapter 1, to the pilgrims of the dispersion, <coughs> literally exiles. They're homeless. Persecution has driven them from Jerusalem. They're probably Peter's writing to them. Peter was an elder, an apostle at Jerusalem. These are most likely Jewish believers who have been scattered by persecution and they're going from place to place. They are facing insults. Chapter 4, verse 14. Insults for doing good. They're being called, yes, bigots. They're being called uh, cruel, unloving people for doing righteousness. They're facing false accusations. Chapter 2, verse 12. Some of them have been beaten in chapter 2, verse 20. Some of them have spent some time in the local police station. Hence the instruction to submit themselves to the government and to follow Christ who was meek and did not raise his voice. They've experienced evil assault in chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Now, this letter was most likely written sometime in the AD 60s for argument's sake. The suggestion is mid-AD 60s. So let's just say for argument's sake, this was AD 65. May give or take either side of that, but it's around AD 65. There was a year where all of these things began to start happening. Think about that. There was a year when they began a year when they were living in Jerusalem and none of these things had yet happened. And then the year ahead, all of a sudden, brought in all these hardships. And I'm sure if, if you'd asked them what their hopes for the year were, none of those things would have been on the list. But why were they going through these things? It was the will of God for them. In 1 Peter 3, 17, For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Verse 19 of chapter 4, Let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good. Uh, chapter 1, verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. And if, if that's not bad enough, this letter is written to a suffering people to prepare them for more suffering. In other words, they, he's describing the trials they have been through and he's writing to them to understand how they are to approach the future sufferings that have yet come on them. We know that because he gives them instruction about how to experience suffering. In chapter 4 verse 12, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. And so we, like these believers whom Peter was writing to, do not know what lies ahead. But I think we can be sure that one thing that lies ahead in 2023 for us all is trials. If need be. And we know that none of us are beyond the Lord's correction. Otherwise we, are, we would already be in glory. And so how should we approach this year? The same way Peter exhorts them to approach the days ahead that they are being called to endure. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. We should look to 2023 with a humble heart and a willingness to accept whatever the Lord ordains. So I actually have one point this morning because there was so much material. There's only things I wanted to say on this one point that I've broken it down into sub-points today. And then this evening I've got three points to look at the remainder of the verses. So my one point, which is the big point, the big title for this message this morning, I have one idea, one hour I'm firing, and it's this, the humble submission. The humble's submission. We are to be a people who humbly submit to the will of God. The Greek literally reads, therefore, be humbled under the mighty hand of God. This is something you allow yourself to experience and do. Now, what does he mean? Well, to put it in various ways. He is saying, be willing to endure whatever the hand of God brings into your life. Easier said than done. But he's saying, as you look ahead... You be resolved, you be determined, you make a decision that says, I do not know what lies ahead, but I will humbly accept whatever God wants to do. I'll make plans, 
I will pursue good goals by all means. But I will accept whatever the Lord brings to pass. I will not be so proud as to suggest that God is ordering my life unwisely, unfairly and unrighteously. This is a humility which says God does a better job of governing my life than I would. You know, I'm pretty sure if God gave you the permission to plan the year ahead, I don't think that any of you would have suffering on the list or trials, hardship, grief, pain, sorrow, regret. It would just be a year of constant good things and just things going well, no pain, ease, success, prosperity. It would be the prosperity gospel, wouldn't it? It would. I mean, we, we, we are very good at criticising prosperity preachers, but I think as I dealt with my own heart and most of the Lord's people, I've come to realise that often our attitudes reflect the fact that we live expecting a prosperity gospel. Don't we? And that, that becomes apparent when things strike us in our lives at the, and we, lo- we, we go, what's, this isn't fair, what's God doing, why is this happening? It's almost as if we expected that a normal Christian life shouldn't have these things. But being humble under the mighty hand of God says, God decides this year for me. Now, what's the opposite of this humility? Well, it's, this isn't a very complicated sermon, it's, these are, and yet they're things we find so hard. The, the easiest things are often the hardest things, yeah? Easy to understand intellectually, hardest to, to actually put into practice. Our greatest problem is not what we don't yet know, our greatest problem is what we already know. It's, it's true for me. I was chatting to a dear friend this week, a pastor, who said to me that he had an accusation recently uh, that um, you preach beyond your experience. To which his reply was, I don't think there's a preacher in the world that sufficiently preaches his, what he's attained to all the time. We're all preaching, we're all out our depth when we're in this book, aren't we? That's the point. That's why we're always applying it to our lives and then apply it to the Lord's people's lives. And the opposite then of humility is pride, isn't it? And there's actually a little illustration of what he's talking about here in verse 5. It's not immediately apparent, but this is the same context. In that verse 5, he speaks of younger people submitting yourselves to elders. Now, we make a mistake if that means just young in age, submitting to old people in age. That would be, can't be what Peter's saying, because, because older people could be wrong, couldn't they? And younger people could be right. And actually, in the context, in verses 1 to 4, he's speaking about the elders who shepherd the flock. So actually, what he's saying there is, young believers, young in faith, submit to those who know the scriptures, who've been appointed by God, uh, to teach the word of God to you. In other words, have a humility which says, I don't come to church thinking I know it all. And I've got n- there's nothing to be said to me anymore. I've, I've known it all. I've sorted it all out. It's a humility which says, I, I'm going to actually submit myself under the word of God. And so actually that illustrates what he's talking about here in, in verse 6. It's a humility which says, God is wise. God knows best. God is, God is righteous. I need to be taught. I need to be led. I need to be directed. This humility is then a, and this is why it's hard, it is a relinquishing of control. And the reason we are an anxious people is because fundamentally we are a controlling people. I am so controlling. We, we, want, we worry because we're trying to control all the things we don't want to happen. We're trying to con- control all the eventualities. That's what anxiety is. It's, it's trying to be God. It's trying to all the things. And, and that's why we get worked up. This is the opposite. This is simply relinquishing control. And that comes out, in, in, we're going to look at this more this evening, casting your care. It's, it's I'm no longer going to take responsibility for these things, I'm going to cast them over, but we'll stop there, we won't go further than that. But at this point we're just saying it's a humility which says, I'm not God. Whatever my ideas for what would make 2023 a good, fruitful year, God has the best plan for me. Now when we talk about God's decree... Confessions and the creeds talk about God's decrees as his determining all things whatsoever come to pass. 
But God, when he looks and plans, he doesn't just choose the wise thing. He knows all the possible things that could be good and he chooses the very best. God, God hasn't been haphazard with your life. God has been very wise and careful choosing what is going to come to us in this year. Oh, dear friends, if I could assure you, I've got lots of great plans for this year. You know, anointed sermons, you know, growing congregation, teachable saints, no t- church tensions, no disagreements, no misunderstandings. That, that's how I want this year to go. <laughs> but the Lord may think, no, actually, you need some misunderstandings. <laughs> You need some church decline, or whatever it is. He's wise. Now, the reason we should do this is because God's in control whether we like it or not. (laughs) Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. What he's saying is, is, you can get all stressed all you want. You can get all worked up. You can strive. You can fight. But there is only one hand directing the affairs of your life. It's the mighty hand of God. Daniel speaks about this hand in Daniel 4.35. He says, quote, All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? So the sooner we sort of say, All right, Lord. I'm going to let you lead this year, moment by moment, and I'm going to embrace whatever you sent. I'm going to accept whatever you ordain as right, the better. Because wrestling against that mighty hand (laughs) isn't going to change what that mighty hand is doing. And actually it only makes the the pain longer. I remember as a child, I don't know if you remember this as kids, maybe you weren't as naughty as I was. But I remember when I was so naughty, having a tantrum. I can, it's, it was so vivid, even now. You know, proper tantrum, proper going nuts. My dad would just grab hold of me, and he'd restrain me like this. And I'd be, you know, you know, I'd be fighting him off. And dad would say to me, the more you struggle, the more you fight, the more it hurts, the more pain you're in. As soon as you calm down and let go, then I will let go. Once I know, you've calmed down. And, and, and I find that just, I often think about that when, I, when God deals with me in certain ways. I remember, and I see myself as doing that exactly again. I'm, I'm going, no, this is, this is not right. This is, and, I'm, and I'm resisting. And it only makes the whole experience more painful. Because when we surrender, then God can fill us with his grace and his strength. Well, just going to look at this, this hand then in a few ways. What is this hand that we are to be humbly submissive to? That's like the second point, be humbly submissive. I had a second point. What is this hand that we are to be humbly submissive to? Obviously, it's a mighty hand of God. But in Scripture, how is this mighty hand described? Firstly, it is described as the hand that controls. And I read to you from Daniel... None can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Rishi Sunak can't stop this hand. Putin can't stop this hand. No powerful politician, no nation on the earth. If all the nations united in a confederacy, they could not stay his hand. It is a hand which therefore accomplishes all that God has determined to do. Peter describes this in, well, not Peter, um, Paul describes this when he describes the, the um, apostles' prayer in Acts 4 when they're let go. We read in Acts 4, verse 24, when they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together, here it is, to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined to be done. What's the point? 
Well, at the crucifixion of Christ, question, were there lots of wills involved? In other words, were there lots of intentions going on? Yeah, of course there were. Pilate had his own issue, reasons why he crucified Christ. He wanted to be popular. He didn't want to lose his authority. He didn't want there to be a rebellion. And so Pilate had a will in the crucifixion of Christ. What about the religious leaders? What about the high priests? Well, they were filled with malice and jealousy and envy of Christ because they knew he was the son of God. They knew he was right. And they knew that was the end of their status and influence. And so they wanted him shut up. And then there were the people. There was that mob rule. And then there was Satan. Satan truly thought that if he formed this united confederacy against the Son of God and he killed him on the cross, that would be the end of the promised seed who would one day crush his head. And so there are all these agendas going on, there are all these intentions, there are all these wills, and yet the apostles say here in their prayer, fundamentally, they did whatever your hand determined to come to pass. They accomplished the will of God. That's the amazing thing about God's will, isn't it? God's sovereignty does not evade man's responsibility. God's determination does not overrule man's own desires. In fact, God's will is accomplished through men's desires. It's an unbelievable, fathomless mystery there. I don't know how all that works. But it's a, they truly were acting as their wills wanted to act. In one sense, that's why Peter said, this Jesus whom you crucified, you did this, you wanted to do this. But it was determined by God. And Peter then is saying, be humble to that hand. Accept what God has willed this year. You can't alter it. You can't change it. Leave your life to God. If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. You know, when I started out in the ministry, I had a youthful zeal. To do great things for God, yeah? And reading things by William Carey and others only fueled that. And Whitfield, and you read all these biographies, you hear, I want to do great things for God. I've got to a point now where I'm literally, I've seen so many men fall away, so many men leave the ministry, so many people leave the faith, that I'm like, literally, if I can just stay a Christian, if I can just follow Jesus this year, if I can just stay close to him, that is how to live. As Jesus said, if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. So often the Lord has to bring things into our lives to bring us to a place where we stop striving and we just resign ourselves to him who is all good and all wise. If our holy God did not spare his son the sufferings of the cross for sinners, we can be sure that we will be given our allotted portion of suffering. Who do we think we are to deserve better? So this hand then is the hand which controls. Secondly, it's the hand that works for deliver, to deliver. Now, if I just stopped at that point, you could have this view of a capricious God who's just sort of sovereignly doing whatever he wants and we're just the victims in just this, this hand that's just indiscriminately just doing stuff, regardless of how it impacts you. But the wonderful thing is in the scriptures, this hand is described as not merely the hand of a sovereign diktat, but a gracious deliverer. It's described as the hand which intervenes in the lives of God's people. Deuteronomy 7 says, The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the people, for you were the least of all peoples, but because the Lord loves you and because he would keep an oath which he swore to your fathers. The Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the, ha the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. The hand of God is the hand which delivered us from our bondage to sin. It's the hand which gave up Christ for us in order to bring us to God. And this is the hand which governs our lives. A gracious hand. A gracious hand which has de demonstrated its graciousness in, in the cross of Jesus Christ. Peter mentions this in verse 19 that those who suffer according to the will of God are to commit their souls to him in doing good as to a, to a faithful creator. This hand then that is governing 2023, which has already determined whatsoever shall come to pass, is not a capricious or mean or cruel or vindicative hand. It's not a hand that if you sin, he's getting one up on you and he's constantly playing, uh, playing with you like his toy. No, 
It is a powerful hand, but it is a loving and tender hand. It is a hand which is mindful. It's not like Lenny in Of Mice and Men, you know, who, who kills the woman because he doesn't know his own strength. God knows his own strength. And he knows our own weakness because the Son of God took on our flesh. And so he knows what we're able to bear. And you can be sure that he will bring things that have been designed for us to do us good into our lives. When you come to forks in the road, in possible trials, this hand will be there to deliver. He won't forget you. Thirdly, it's a hand which works to, to overrule. Wrong will be done to you this year. Wrong may be committed by you this year. You may fail in many things this year. Sin will be committed this year. Mistakes will be made this year. Evil may well be witnessed this year. But what you can be sure of, this mighty hand is so mighty that it's able to overrule all these things for your good. He works all things. Do you believe that? Even all that's happened in 2022 to you. If you're his child, he works all things, and that all means all. Sin, failure, all your regrets. He works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his, his purpose. Jo Joseph, think of how much evil... I mean evil that Joseph experienced from the hands of his brothers and the suffering in the prison and he was forgotten in prison and then he did a righteous thing by resisting Potiphar's wife and then he suffered for that. God was overruling it for his good and all his people's good. Do you believe this? What is going on with LGBTQ++++? All this stuff that's going on in our culture is being worked for the good of his church. You say, I don't believe you. All things. All things. Ephesians 1 tells us that Christ has been appointed as head, of over, head over all things for his church. So his governing of all things is for his church. So what he is governing and allowing to happen in the United Kingdom is for his glory and for his church. I mean, there's a sense in which we should be sad about what's happening. The scriptures tell us this. We should weep because men do not keep the law of God. Like Habakkuk, we should be concerned when the word of God seems powerless. <coughs> so there is, a, there is a balance to be struck here. We're not, we're not going to be happy that sin is being committed. By no, absolutely. But there must be another sense, and I don't sense this so much in the, in the Reformed Church, another sense which says, uh, you know, God's, God's okay. God's on the throne. Jesus is on the throne. He has the keys. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Christ is sovereign. Christ is ruling. Christ is reigning. Christ is doing good. You know, we often turn on the news and we think, you know, what, what is God doing? I mean, we imagine that somehow we would do things better. But God is doing the best and most wise thing with the world. And it takes faith to believe that. But my dear friends, if the suffering of the sinless Son of God, if the butchering of Jesus Christ, if the nails in his hands and his feet, if, if the rejection of men, if the, if the open wounds on his flesh, if the crown of thorns in his head, if the turning away of the Father, if the most horrific event in history was accomplishing the most wonderful thing in, in, in the world, the salvation of his people, then I can say by faith, there is nothing so dark, because you know, we think what's going on is dark. That was the darkest moment in history, when all the sins of his people were laid on him, and the father turned his face away. If God was using that for good, he's using all things for good. So we go into this year knowing that we're under the hand that we are to submit to as an overruling hand. God has a higher end in mind that outweighs our present troubles. So if you look over all the things you're going through and all the things you have been through and you will go through, you can say, God will overrule this for my good. 
I'm preaching beyond my experience here. Because there will be some things that some of you might go through this year that I've not been through, the loss of a loved one or something like that. And I don't say that, and we're in this kind of culture today where it says, well, what do you know about these things? You never experienced these things. To which we have to say, I'm not saying this because I know this or I've experienced this. I'm saying this because the word of God tells me God works all things together for good. So I, on the authority of God's word, I say to you, you can know this this coming year. God overruling. God's way is best. Peter is in a way saying to us, don't fight against the sovereign hand of God, even when it takes you through the waters. You will not drown. Now, closing comment to you if you're not a Christian. Is there anyone here or streaming online that's not a believer? You can't fight this hand. Whether you like it or not, from the moment you were born, this is the hand that is directing your life. You see, sinners like to think of themselves as autonomous, independent creatures. But you are dealing with God every day. You heard of Belshazzar. He was Nebuchadnezzar's son. He was wicked. He was evil. He did not acknowledge the Lord. He forgot what God did to Nebuchadnezzar when he humbled him. He lived in self-indulgence. And in one evening, at the height of his rebellion and sin, he took out all the, all the items from the temple, the, the, the drinking items, and he, he threw a party, and, and, and as an act of sort of desecration and blasphemy, he used all the things that were ordained for holy use in the temple for unholy use. And some writing appeared on the wall, and a hand was, was writing this on the wall. And Daniel was brought in to interpret the writing to Belshazzar. Listen to what Daniel says. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honour. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whoever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was disposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beast and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the most high God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew this and you lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. And he says, And you do not acknowledge the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways. You have not glorified him. Whether you like it or not then, you are dealing with God right now. God is dealing with you. He is holding you. He is owning all your ways. He is holding your breath in his hands and he will continue to do so. 2023 may be the year you meet the Lord. I suspect some of us here won't be here this time next year. Are you prepared to meet your God? Can you endure his wrath against your sin? Have you humbled yourself? Have you got to the, gone to the cross where God's mighty hand was displayed in condemning his innocent son to be a saviour for sinners like you? Will your first act of 2023 be to humble yourself, confess your sin and rebellion, ask God to forgive you, trusting in Christ that he has finished all that is necessary to save you? That is the greatest humbling that you can do. And in fact, you can't do this kind of humbling that I've described unless you first humble yourself in that way. I'm a sinner. I've rebelled against you, I've been proud, I thought I could live my life without you, I can ignore you, I can do things my own way. And God, God, God looks at the sons of men and he, he, he laughs, he scorns at men who think that somehow they're autonomous creatures. He gives them their breath, he holds together the atoms in their bodies, he feeds them, he provides the rain from the heaven, he causes the sun to rise on the evil. He looks at how, and one day you'll stand before this God. And so it takes great humility then. To be stopped in your tracks, so to speak, and say, right, I've had it all wrong, I've been proud, I need God, save me, Lord, Lord. And when you ask him to save you, then this becomes possible. 
You can live your life. Not guarantee, I can't guarantee you an easy life, but I can promise you that you'll be able to make sense of life in the sense that you can say, to the degree to which you can say, God is good. God is wise. He gave his son for me. I know that. I don't doubt that. And if he gave his son for me, what he's dealing with me in my life is an, is an act of his grace and his love and his goodness. Well, time has run out. We'll expand on the last two parts of the verse of this evening. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Peter. Lord, these people that he wrote to really, really knew of suffering. And none of us have probably ever been through anything like they were going through. But Lord, we pray that we would humble ourselves under your mighty hand. If they could do it by your grace, so can we. If they could embrace the will of God for them, which was so difficult, Lord, would we be prepared to know our place as servants of God? And a servant does not dictate to the master how you deal with us. Oh, Lord, would we be pleased? Would we be enabled to look to your loving face, to look to the Lord Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, and to submit ourselves to you, knowing that whatever you ordain is right. Amen.